Hello and welcome to Six Figure Authors, the show that helps take your writing career to the next level. I'm Lindsay Baroker and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Andrea Pearson. And I'm Joe Lalo. And this week we're interviewing successful science fiction author Jason Onsbach, who writes with Nick Cole for the popular Galaxy's Edge series. In addition to killing it with his books, he is one of the few authors I've run into who actually makes money from merchandising. So we'll be asking him about that. And for the curious among you, Jason lives with his wife and seven kids in Puyallup, Washington, uh, which must make working from home a bit of a challenge. So we may also have a few questions about that. Yeah. Uh, welcome to the show, Jason. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, it can be challenging, but it's, it's not too bad. It's not too bad. We can see from the, those watching the video that Jason has locked away in his basement. So yeah. perhaps the uh, kids will <laughs> not be running through. Or Yeah, uh, I told them not. It's the upstairs running, you know, the herd of elephants that, that you want to try to avoid. So, so I've bribed them. They're all sugared up. They should be good to go. Excellent. I hear sugar puts kids to sleep. So that Eventually, <laughs> right. You just have to get it in them early enough. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey as an author? Yeah. So uh, like you said, my name's Jason and um, I started writing, uh, let's say professionally. I published my first book in 2015 and uh, I think I made a mistake a lot of people made. I had this idea that was really a lot of ideas, but I wanted to get it all down in one. So I had a book that was probably three or four genres at once and it did okay. It, it didn't do bad. It, it made money, but um, wasn't making me the kind of money that would allow me to make this a career. Um, so then that was three books. And then uh, Nicole and I were talking and he asked me, well, if you could write anything, what would you write? And I said, oh, I'd probably write some kind of mashup of Star Wars and G.I. Joe, like just get that, that whole atmosphere going. And he said, well, why don't you do it? Um, so I did and uh, worked with him on it. And, and that book became the first Galaxy's Edge book. And uh, it took off like absolute wildfire. Um, changed, uh, changed my writing career overnight. And um, we haven't really looked back since. So um, that's, that's kind of where it went. Had a long history of writing for fun, um, writing screenplays, doing things like that. But um, uh, we were really blessed to professionally find success within two years of, of really seriously going after it. Now, your success is actually, uh, my husband's heard of you. And he oh, reads sci-fi military and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. He's, um, it's, it's unusual for my husband to have heard of an author that I didn't already know about. So, which was pretty cool. I was like, Hey, we're interviewing him like next week. <laughs> See, he just reads the right books. That's all right. That's all it is. So. <laughs> he, he's like, I told you, you should have read his book. I'm like, I've been reading all the books in my field. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, um, as someone who comes from a family of seven kids, I, I'm, that's pretty awesome. So I'm, there's seven in my family. Um, oh, right on. Yeah, but how do you and your wife run your household and still make sure you get your writing time in? Do you, I mean, is this your workspace, excuse me, your workspace around you? Yeah, more or less. I mean, you know, I have a, a standing desk here. I'm sitting now. Um, so I'll do this, but l like, you know, you can get away if you need to. I, I've got a little Surface Pro. So if I, if I need to go outside into the backyard, I can do that. If, uh, if it's one of the th three months that it doesn't rain, I can do that, I guess I should say. Um, but uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. My wife, she was a stay at home mom prior when I, when I was working uh, in the private world. Um, and, uh, really they had to adjust to me. So, uh, the, the kids are home. Uh, we homeschool. She was a school teacher before she became uh, a school teacher, um, to like a whole classroom of kids. And, uh, you know, we just kind of worked it out. Like, uh, if, if I'm in a zone, I close the door. People know not to knock on the door unless there's like blood or fire involved. And, uh, you know, it just kind of works out. You just find a way that works for yourself. Um, really, the problem is uh, being able to walk away from work. I'd say that's that's the bigger issue is actually going to see that family and saying, all right, I got to step away from what I'm doing here and keep somewhat normal hours. Um, but otherwise, it works pretty well. It wasn't that hard for us. That's awesome. That's I understand that. I mean, we homeschool and it's it's most, mostly just me. And so like trying to separate work from family and homeschool is just it's it's a challenge. <laughs> Yeah, it's like your life is definitely full. Yeah, no kidding. Um, okay, so any advice for those who would like to co-write? Um, basically, are there any challenges you didn't expect or things you thought would be a challenge that have not been? Um, I, I think it helped that we were friends ahead of time. Uh, I, I think that there, there's, there's two significant challenges. And the first is um, compatibility with the person because if you end up with a big hit, 
um, you're, you're married to that person. You've got like your spouse, but now you also have your co-writer and those are two significant marriages because uh, now you've got um, someone that's relying on you and you're relying on them to keep doing what they do. And so uh, you definitely have to vet the person you're with. Um, and that's like whether that's work ethic, whether that's integrity, um, there's a lot of different things, whether it's just uh, a good ability to get along and, and compromise. Um, those things are, are absolutely huge. Um, Nick and I were already friends, but even as friends, we've had those times where, you know, we've kind of round on the phone trying to um, reconcile a difference. And so if you already don't have that foundation set up, uh, it's something to be prepared for. It's something, something to be there. Um, because like, you know, what are you going to do? It's not like you can just go off and say, well, I'll write my books, you write yours. Um, you own a property and, and uh, what you're doing is going to impact what they can do creatively and what they're doing impacts what you can do creatively. Uh, and then there's all the other problems that can come with owning a business together, right? Like how much do you want to spend on this? How much do you want to spend on that? How much do you want to keep for yourself? So um, I think it helps to plan for success ahead of time have a very clear understanding of who does what, how you're going to arbitrate, uh, how you're gonna settle your differences. Um, all those things ahead of time help out. Um, if you're just thinking we're gonna write a book and we'll just, one of us will just divide by two every month and not think anything more of it, that'll get you so far. But again, if you end up with a big hit and there's people saying, hey, we wanna do this, we wanna do that, and now you both have to decide do you sell rights here? Do you go ahead and do a comic book here? Um, it, it gets complicated really quickly. And both of you have writing experience before this, or did one of you start out as a new writer? Um, you know, we both had writing experience before this. Nick, uh, before Galaxy's Edge came out, he was with Harper Collins. He had actually just gotten uh, finished up with Harper Collins. Um, there's a, there's, there's a big whole sorted backstory that goes with that. Um, he had an editor who didn't like what he wrote and said, change it or we'll cancel your contract. And he said, well, cancel my contract then. So they did. And, uh, and he won a dragon award for that book and, and, uh, did really well. Um, but, uh, yeah, so he started, I think 2011 is what he was like one of the first people in that sort of indie rush. Um, uh, really like, like Lindsay, um, someone that just kind of said, let's see how this works. And uh, he wrote a book called The Old Man in the Wasteland and it sold 100,000 copies. And, uh, and then there's this period in time where all the publishers were just, they didn't know what to do with indies, but they were just buying them up like, oh, this will just translate to instant sales. They had no idea how to market. And then they said, oh, this is a waste of time. And they, and they got rid of a lot of them. Um, but some of them stuck around and made pretty well for themselves. Now, uh like, what's the division of labor on, on co-writing? Because, I mean, Good Omens just was a very successful TV show, which was co-written by Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett, two of my favorite authors. Mm -hmm. And they went into great detail in the pre-word for the, uh, or, you know, uh, foreword for, for those books mm -hmm. about how they split it up. So, like, how do you, how do you split up a, a co-written novel? We have actually done it a lot of different ways. Um, the, very first, uh, the very first book... Um, one of us was, uh, I guess the first book that we really, it's not the first book that came out, but it's the first book that we worked on together. Um, we essentially took two plot lines and said, you're going to write this perspective. Uh, I'm going to write this perspective. And then when the perspectives merge, you take it from there. Um, we've done that. And, um, that's probably the hardest way to do it because you have to invariably go back and begin to massage a lot of content because, uh, chrono chronologies won't work out or, or just, you know, you, you say one thing that you think is an aside, but you accidentally ruin like everything the other guy worked on unless you change it. Um, so we've done that. And uh, lately we've been doing a process where we sit down and we plot out uh, the book. We hit the high marks as far as this is how it's going to end. This is what needs to happen to get there. But you know, the journey is up to you. And then one of us will just take the lead and sort of be like the lead writer. And then it goes to the next person. Uh, to just overwrite and start interjecting their personality and their voice into it so that we end up with a finished product that uh, really exemplifies both of our works. And um, the thing we always want to avoid is having something where people can say, I, I know who wrote this or I know who wrote that. So that if someone like hates me, they've got to read it anyway, because they won't know who wrote what. That's excellent. And it seems like, uh, like you say there, like with that second tactic where somebody goes through afterwards, interjects, it seems like that would be uh, very useful for a sort of unifying voice. Like yeah. even if things were, even if there was, even if you did the first way where, where it was two different plot lines written by two different people, as long as you have one person 
unify it at the end. It seems like that would really smooth out seams like that. Yeah, that helps out a lot. And then obviously getting it to a good editor who can then go even further and, and kind of point out, say, you know, you always refer to this person this way. And then it disappears for 200 pages. And now it's back. We're like, oh, okay, yeah, I see what we did here. Um, just little things like that. But that's, that's been my favorite way to do it is just to give one guy the lead and say, just go to town. And the other guy goes and cleans it up. I find that that's uh, the most efficient way of getting a, a solid book. And when we look at which one of our books get uh, the best acclaim from our readers, it tends to be that system that works. So uh, it's working for us. And that's what we've been doing for a while now. Uh, going into a project like this, do you sort of lay out what you feel your strengths and weaknesses are, or does it just sort of come out uh, naturally? Um, we're we're really open with each other, um, so we both have different strengths and weaknesses. Um, Nick tends to be a guy that really enjoys uh, narrative and painting pictures, uh, painting uh, emotional pictures as well as um, just working with uh, the scenery. Um, I am a dialogue guy. I, I would just I would just write screenplays all day if there was any any money in it, just like just have people talk back and forth. So that helps us out quite a bit because there will be scenes that um, uh, he'll do a fantastic, amazing job, but nobody said a word for five, six, seven, eight pages. And I tend to, to just go in and fill that out. And uh, we really compliment each other that way. But that harkens back to um, having a good, working relationship with your partner, uh, having the ability to just be upfront with, hey, I think this is my strength. I think this is where you struggle. And then having the humility to be able to say, yeah, you know, you are better at doing that than I am. So will you please handle this part? Because it's important. Um, there's a lot of, uh, I think, sacrifice that you have to do. Um, as well as if you create a character that everybody loves, um, you don't really get to say, oh, that's, I did that. Um, it's a team effort and you just got to be on there together. Well, as someone who also enjoys writing the dialogue as my favorite part, I'm, I'm with you. I wish we could just sell some screenplays, you know, no, know. no need to fill in that other stuff. <laughs> I know it's coming, man. Audiobooks are, are I think, going to take us there. That's, that's a, that's a different conversation, but um, I'm actually working on some projects where that's essentially all I'm doing is writing uh, full cast dramas for Galaxy's Edge and, um, and then hope that they cast good enough actors to make it sound as good in the ears as it does in my head. Oh, that sounds awesome. Uh, let us know when that's out and uh, we'll check it out for sure. Sure. Yeah, probably six years given how long it takes. To... <laughs> yeah, right around the corner. Right. So you mentioned that you wrote a few things before Galaxy's Edge and maybe they didn't do quite as well. Mm -hmm. Did you, you know, what did you do differently with the new series to take, to have it take off so well? Or, or was there like a luck element or are you just really focused in that military sci-fi kind of genre? Yeah, I think that there is a luck element. Um, I, I feel like that's got to be the case, right? Like, um, there is a certain level of that in that we came and hit an audience that really wanted content uh, right at the right time. And so there's a lot of word of mouth. But from a marketing perspective, you know, with my first series, I did, I think, what a lot of authors do, which is I wrote a book. I'm so excited about it, and I'm just not going to shut up about it. And, and, you know, you're literally counting sales. And so anybody that will give you a sale is your best friend, and um, you're, just, you're just happy about that. What I didn't realize was that by just getting everybody I knew to buy a book without any sense of are you the right reader for this book, I was really kind of training Amazon to go ahead and sell that book to the wrong people. And so I shot myself in the foot before I even went going. By the time uh, Galaxy's Edge started, we already knew that that's kind of how the things work. We had talked with our friend uh, Chris Fox quite a bit, and he sort of clued us into, hey, this is the way Amazon sells books for you, um, which he covers in all his books. And um, I think it's fairly common knowledge at this point. But um, we knew we had two different audiences. Nick had come from kind of a post-apocalyptic audience. Um, I had this sort of urban fantasy noir micro audience, let's say. It was not like I was, you know, burning down any houses. Um, so we specifically decided we were going to start from scratch and build a brand new audience. And so um, the book really, our first book released in June of 2017, but in 2016, we we're already laying the groundwork, uh, starting fan clubs, starting a subscription service, getting people who were big fans of the genre and really liked our sales pitch to get in at the ground level and come along for the ride. Um, and then we launched just going after those readers only, not, not telling our friends, not telling our social media, 
just finding people who we knew had readers who matched our demographic, uh, advertising to those readers and getting the word out. And then it just sort of kept expand, you know, it was like compound interest just every day. It seemed more and more people were buying or reading and it just blew up from there. What kind of advertising were you doing? Like Facebook, Amazon, or word of mouth in person? Uh, you know, so much of it was word of mouth. That's where I feel like there's a certain luck factor. There was so much that uh, we, we struck a nerve because, um, so in a lot of science fiction, a lot of military science fiction, uh, people get caught in Vietnam and World War II, right? Like they're retelling the battles of World War II. They're retelling Vietnam and that's fun. But uh, we felt like there's a whole generation of veterans who fought in the Mideast and their experiences weren't really showing up in science fiction. So uh, one of our, our easy pitches was, hey, this is like stormtroopers in Afghanistan. Uh, because that's essentially what Legionnaire is, our first book that we put out. And um, once a lot of vets started reading that, that's a very close-knit community. A lot of those guys are still very close to the people that they deployed with and served with. So they started telling units. Um, we started, you know, just boxes of books getting shipped out overseas, um, copies being spread all throughout uh, deployment areas in Iraq and in Afghanistan. And... Um, Everybody was just sort of saying to their buddies, hey, you've got to read this. These guys get it. This is us. And uh, that helped more than anything else. You know, we did like a little bit of Facebook ads. We did a little bit of Amazon ads, but it was writing something that resonated with an existing audience that that audience could embrace as their own. That helped us more than anything else. So romance and fantasy authors listening, um, pick that, that war, the Middle East, and then try mm -hmm. to make it work. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. If you can just go ahead and get that, that nice <laughs> Afghanistan romance going, I think, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's going to have to be kind of a dark romance, right? Cause that's the other thing with, with, with uh, a lot of vets is there's, there's a military gallows humor that's very specific and uh, very irreverent and still fun. <laughs> and um, we wanted to be able to hit on that, but still have something that uh, people could share with their kids. So, um, and like we don't drop uh, f bombs or anything like that in any of our books, um, even though we know all those words. I'm pretty sure I've learned them all by now. But um, because we also wanted it to be something where you could say to your friend, but you could also say to your your 12 year old, 13 year old son, read this. And uh, and so we have a lot of uh, a lot of readers in that age group too. So and that's really awesome. Okay, so if you had to basically do a similar similar series, but without a co writer, what would you do differently, and what would you do the same? Um, I think now I would have stockpiled some, some finished books at the time we had like a couple books and then we realized, man, this is really hot. Um, I think we had our, our first book up and we had planned to release our second book, which was done two weeks later. And you know, we got thousands of pre-orders in a two week period. And then we're thinking, oh man, okay, now what are we gonna do for book three? Cause people are already asking, Hey, when's book three come out? Um, and so there was this period where you know, I'm working a full-time job and uh, I, I'm literally spending every night, all night, just trying to write fast enough to get something out there that wasn't going to be garbage. Um, that, that would have been the worst possible thing we could have done is put out some garbage. So now if I was to go and, and start over, um, it would be be prepared for, again, set yourself up for success, be prepared and be ready to say, here's the next, here's the next, here's the next, so that if you do hit uh, and things get really hot uh, right at first, you've got some time to work. You've got some time to to, to fine tune and go. Um, it was fun, but like if you look at my author profile picture from before that book hit, like all my hair is like dark and there's no gray in my beard. And now it's just like, it's gray and everything's just, it's not good. And And I really feel like a lot of that stems from the stress of success, which sounds like you're whining about it, but at the same time, we have the saying, you know, once you get on the back of the tiger, don't get off, um, you know, or, or it's going to eat you up. And, uh, and that's what it took. So it was a stressful time of just pushing myself and sleeping, you know, two hours a day, doing a day job and just kind of saying, all right, but if this takes, if this holds, it's going to change our life. Um, and it did, but I would not want to have to go through that again by any stretch. I've gotten too lazy. All right. Now, that, that sort of covers what I was going to ask is um, like, obviously, you had something of a plan coming into this and you didn't you realize that you didn't have enough of that plan done at the time right. that you, you started to become successful. But like, how much of a plan did you have and how much of a plan do you have for, for a series like this? Yeah, I mean, we knew uh, we knew the story arc. We kind of knew where we were going with everything. We figured we were doing a series and um, 
we were doing, uh, you know, books that were 70, 80,000 words, like 90 on the long end, um, really writing for the ebook market. And we had this thought that, you know, we're probably not going to find any real traction until we get four or five books in. Um, because at the time we had this, this theory that there was uh, a group of sort of Kindle Unlimited readers who are waiting to see a full series or pretty close to a full series, and then they'll dive in. Um, but what ended up happening was the first book just sold like just insane amounts, um, you know, wildest, well beyond our wildest imagination. And um, so we didn't have the, uh, the grace time that we thought we'd have. Um, we knew we had to go month after month is what we felt like we needed to do. Um, so that, that would be a big part of the change. The second part of the change was um, our audio books ended up being bundled uh, two books in one with uh, Podium Publishing who got the rights to that. And, and that's primarily because people are more likely to give you a credit if you have a longer audio book. Well, seven hour audio book didn't cut it. So, um, so now when we write, uh, we, we're writing long for that exact reason to say if it's not at least a 10 hour book, um, we don't think it's a, it's, a, it's a wise idea having moved in the audio market. And right now I think like three to one is our audio to ebook sales. Um, like we've just really uh, seen growth in that market. So we're writing to that market and, and that's another aspect is writing more, um, which is tough because when you're writing ebooks, that's two books that you can release. And, uh, and we're saying, no, it's, it's only one now. And so your output gets cut in half as a result, but we feel like the reward is better by being up at the front in the audio market. So you basically catered your whole everything to my husband. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Audiobooks. <laughs> yeah. And, and what we found was, you remember there's like a period where people were almost kind of embarrassed to say that they listened to audiobooks, or at least that was my perspective. It's like, you would say, oh, have you read this? And they'd say, oh yeah, I read that. And then they'd sheepishly be like, well, I listened to it. Um, there were, people were kind of embarrassed to say that they were listening to their books as, um, I think that that stigma is going away and more and more people are consuming. I mean, audiobooks are the growth market right now. Like that market is growing leaps and bounds. I think it was what 30% growth last year. Um, that's not pulling from print readers, right? Like that's pulling from ebook readers. Ebooks revolutionized the marketplace because it was so much more convenient than print for people. And you had this idea of, I'm going to have this one little device and all my library is going to be on it. And it's going to save me so much space. Um, well, with the way, our society is now and the amount of time people are spending in cars or the easy ability to have earbuds in and be at the gym or going for a walk. Um, it's much more convenient just to have the book performed than it is to even use your tablet and read. So we, we saw that and we said, I think this is where everything's going. And so when that audiobook came out, we essentially treated it like a second launch and we asked everybody we knew to please just push that audiobook um, like everything. Like we said, we don't, you don't have to push our ebooks, just let people know about this audiobook, encourage them to listen to an audiobook if they've never done it before. And so that audiobook went to, I think, boy, it was like the top 20 in the Audible store and um, it just, sold like crazy. And so it was this whole, you know, more than anything else, that was the afterburner that took it from success here to success in audio. And it completely changed our market. Um, now Audible gives us um, pretty sizable uh, fees to be exclusive uh, for six months. So we, you know, it's, I, it sucks for readers and, and and we think we're big enough that in our next contract we can say no we're not going to do that anymore but at the time that's what it took to get celebrity narrators and all those things um but uh but yeah that's that's been our that's been our shift is we feel like audio is the future and so we write specifically with audio in mind now that's good you just answered one of our facebook questions <laughs> oh hey so you're welcome. The celebrity narrator part. Oh, um, yeah. So I've got a question from Brandon Ellis also in our Facebook group and he's, hey, he's read your books and him. he was, sorry, what was that? I know Brandon. Oh, yeah. do you? Good. Yeah, yeah, he's a good guy. <laughs> awesome. He's wondering about the switch from first person to third person. Um, we are just, uh, we get bored easy. I think that's all it really boils down to. So, you know, we wrote, awesome. I, we wrote first person in the first one because I thought that's the way the story would be tell, told the best. Um, second person, uh, we were doing, we, we knew it was going to be more than just one character's perspective. So um, third person made a lot of sense uh, for the next book because you can keep so much, so, so many things hidden. Um, and we were building up the idea that we had in our series was, hey, we want it to sort of be like Lost where you get into something 
And then all of a sudden it says, well, let's talk about this character. And I don't know if you watched that show, um, but back when it was on, you'd really get into a character and then all of a sudden the next episode would start and it would be this other guy on the, on the crash site that you didn't care about at all. And you'd be like, Oh, what are you doing? I don't care about this guy. Get me back to the dude from party of five, whatever his name is. Um, and, uh, and then by the end of the episode, you'd be like, Oh, that's, that's my new favorite guy. I like this guy now. So we wanted to do something like that where we keep showing parts of a large interlocking story. And then by the time we got to book five, everything goes together. And that required us to do a uh, third person. And then because Nick is just crazy, he also introduced a second person perspective in the third book, which was a, a bit of a gamble, but again, that paid off. Um, so, but that's really it. We've gone back to first in our, our, our newest release. We, we have part first and part third. Um, sometimes first person is the best way to give the perspective if you wanna really uh, get a character and get his insight down. And sometimes uh, it doesn't work unless you want to make that guy seem like an idiot um, because, you know, everything that's hidden from him, unless you're being dishonest, has to be hidden from the reader then. And, um, and there's times where we want the reader to know things that the characters don't know uh, to get the effect that we want later on in the books. So I have to ask you a couple of questions about the audio because, you know, I was looking over there while you were talking about it, like, oh, 12,500 ratings. That's not bad. <laughs> no, that's pretty good. We were happy about that. <laughs> so did you, um, how do you handle it when you're bundling? Like, it sounds like you released one and two as one and mm -hmm. got 17 hours. Um, are yeah. you matching it to an ebook like duology well, on Amazon? That was the hard part. Um, we didn't do that. Um, initially they matched it to the first book and then they took it off. So we just put uh, like a advantage page that says, Hey, here's how the audiobooks work. So like, it's clear as mud, but it's like, you've got 10 <laughs> eBooks and you've got six audiobooks uh, in that main, main season arc. So they, they called that galaxy's edge part one. It's actually two books. And that caused some confusion because people were thinking this is one book. And all of a sudden there's a total switch. Like you go from a first person self-contained story to, a new book in third person and the people that you knew from the first book are nowhere to be seen. And it makes a bit more sense if you're reading, but in audio it didn't. So, um, so yeah, we just, we just have, uh, we have our page with, uh, if you look at the Amazon page uh, for the, for the books themselves, it has that uh, Amazon advantage from the publisher section. So we just try to sort of explain, here's what galaxy's edge is doing and here's how you can listen to it on audio. Um, and people find it pretty well from there. All right, I had to ask because I'm kind of going through the same thing now. I've I've done like three book omnibuses, one through three, mm -hmm. and of course had those do better on Audible because they're a credit for 20 however many hours. Yeah. But then we went into like four or five, six individually, and it, you I, you get more drop off like than right. necessarily you would do the eBooks because they're like, wait a minute, this is only 10 hours instead of 30 hours. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. No, that's that's the downside to it, and that's kind of what we uh, in in writing for for audio, you know. I think our minimum now is 110,000. We sort of feel like if we can't do 110,000 words, then we need to go back to the drawing board and figure out what other uh, things to put into it. But um, even then, there's people that are like, well, this book was 18 hours and this is 100 or 12 hours. And you just kind of shrug your shoulders and say, I, I hope it's worth it. Like, you know, we feel like it's good, but um, it's not really an environment where we can sit back and, uh, and write that long and keep people happy with, I want the next installment right now, right now, right now, which is another aspect of readership that sort of Netflix, give me the whole season and let me just binge it. Um, that's crept over into writing and um, we hear about it a lot. We feel slow nowadays. <laughs> Well, it's a challenge too, because it's uh, only audible really where this is a, a thing, but that's mm -hmm. the main player right now. And yeah. I think podium goes exclusive with them. Mm -hmm. uh, at least you said for six months or something. Yeah. Well, we're not with podium anymore. Um, mm -hmm. They, they did our first season and then, um, and then when we talked to them about re-upping audible came in and, and they kind of did the same thing that they did with Andy Weir in the Martian, but with much smaller checks um, to get us to go and, and work with Audible Studios. So everything we do now is with Audible Studios for Galaxy's Edge. Well, that makes it easy to choose <laughs> to <laughs> cater yourselves to Audible then. Yeah, right. Keep them happy. All right. Well, uh, next question. I actually wanted to ask you and mention building a fan club before you actually mm -hmm. launched the books. Mm -hmm. What did you do to get people to actually like, was this a mailing list or a Facebook page? How did you get folks on there early? <laughs> it was, it was both. Um, there, there was a, there was a small Facebook page 
Um, but what we wanted to do is keep people on our site and, uh, and grow a specific mailing list. And uh, so Nick had this, this person that he knew that taught uh, music lessons and, and he did it as like a ministry. He was a really talented musician and he did it as a uh, ministry in Los Angeles and he would go um, to people who just uh, couldn't otherwise afford professional music lessons and he would teach them piano or whatever else for a very small fee, like way less than you pay at one of the big stores. And so someone had asked him, well, why do you charge at all, right? Like you're, you're trying to help people. And what he said was that he found that when people actually are forced to pay, even if it's a small amount, their commitment level goes up substantially because now they have skin in the game. Now it actually means something. I'm paying something for this. So we started a subscription service and it started off like a dollar a month. And I think we had a $1 level, a $5 level and a $10 level. And what we said was, here's this group, here's what we're releasing, here's what it looks like, we're going to let you see it as, as we write it, we're going to make ourselves completely available, talk to you about uh, what we do, what our theories are on writing, just give you the whole picture. And then in addition to that, you know, we'll, have, we'll, we'll send you signed copies of books. We were just doing things like that. We would try to find things that we could do that would kind of just make them feel happy to be part of this club. So um, we would make up vinyl decals and send them out to them. And, and so that started off with a really small group. I think our list was less than two, less, it was definitely less than 500 people when we actually launched Legionnaire. Um, so it wasn't a huge list at all that we went to, but it was uh, a group of people that were totally in, like they, they had completely bought in on it and they were so excited about it and so willing to talk to other people about it that they were really the drive that helped it grow and helped it get word of mouth. These people that just were, you know, telling other people and sharing the books. Um, but that was it. It was just a lot of a uh, Facebook group updating with what we were doing. And we knew the audience, you know, Nick was in the army. I grew up in the, uh, in uh, an army family. We knew that military audience. We knew people that liked Star Wars. I was a huge Star Wars nerd. Um, I knew what people liked about it, who liked the expanded universe, the people that collected, you know, the decipher Star Wars cards and could name all the super minor characters. Um, that was me. So it was just a place where we would talk about those things. And as excitement grew and we made ourselves available, uh, people started sort of proselytizing and evangelizing Galaxy's Edge on our behalf. And it grew from there. And, uh, and then once you, I mean, once you've got people like tattooing your book covers on their body and sharing it on social media, like it, it, it only takes a few retweets before people are like, oh, these, these guys must be legit. And, uh, and we weren't like, we, you know, we were, we were legit just like any indie is legit, but, um, but we weren't. And, um, and then Disney came and named their theme park Galaxy's Edge a few months after we had uh, launched our book. And uh, I don't know if that, I, I think in some ways that hurt us, but um, it may have helped us, right? Like there, every once in a while, I'll see a review that's like, this is a weird Star Wars book. And we're like, oh, well, there's a reason for that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's essentially it. Now it has its culture. It's, it's, it's a, it fits a strong um, kind of veteran culture. Those guys have, uh, have a lot of fun on the fan club, um, posting memes, debating what's going to happen in the book. Um, it's a really cool group. We raised uh, $10,000 for uh, veteran suicide prevention last November as a, as a drive we did with some of our narrators. It's just like, yeah, it's a community for lack of a better word, it's its own fandom. And um, once that gets established, uh, you, just, you just grow it, just keep watering it. That's really cool. And I wonder if you have a fan at Disney because I, I was looking at your book one cover, you know, I've seen it around, you've kept it selling for three years. Yeah, I was like, this looks a that. lot like the Mandalorian, uh, you know, the cover they have for that that came two years later. I was like, I wonder if they saw that book and were like, hmm. yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't add any fuel to the fire, but there are a lot of conspiracy theorists that, that absolutely bind. I'm pretty sure that, that the guys that did the Mandalorian, you know, just had a similarly great idea and we're all kind of standing on the shoulders of giants when we write in science fiction anyway. So you have to be a little arrogant, whether you're writing fantasy or science fiction to sit up there and say, Oh, this is unique. This is new. Um, you know, like we've all seen Star Wars, we've all seen Star Trek, we've all, well, we've read Dune. There's just so much, like we've read Tolkien. Um, there's so much that we're standing on. And uh, I think we just kind of embraced that and said, look, at some point, something like Star Wars is part of the mythos that we like live in. It would be like 
you know, telling a tale about King Arthur, right? Someone from 1107 isn't going to show up and be like, hey, hey, you're, you're stealing, right? It's such a part of the mythos that people just get it. So if you're using themes from Star Wars, which I mean, are themes from Joseph Campbell, they're, they're not really unique. Um, but if you're doing that and you're trying to capture a feel of excitement and adventure, um, I think it can resonate now because it's part of our shared psyche and uh, you can tap into that. Did you actually have any hesitation when you picked the cover? Because it's actually different than most of the military sci-fi is spaceships in space, and you've got mm -hmm. this desert, dark figure in armor. It's kind of, right. it stands out, but sometimes that backfires. <laughs> yeah, it can backfire for sure. Um, but, but no, it was for that reason. Like to me, I, I never understood why like military science fiction just kept having starship covers over and over again. Um, and and I also knew from my own experience that even though they were the bad guys, like in Star Wars, all the coolest stuff came from the Empire, right? Like X-Wings and Y-Wings, and those look cool. I mean, I'll, I'll give you that. Those look cool. But like most of the time you see fan art, it's people drawing stormtroopers. It's people um, photoshopping, you know, at, -AT walkers um, into San Francisco. It's all that stuff because that's the cool stuff. It's, it's never or it's rarely, you know, um, the techs that are running around cleaning up the X-Wings. It's, it's rarely the uh, pilots in the orange jumpsuit. It's that kind of military uh, shock trooper look. And so we just said, hey, everybody's doing this. We feel like if we show very clearly what kind of a story we're gonna tell on this cover, it's going to stand out because it's just not another starship with, um, with like a monochromatic glow of neon, uh, you know, kind of like a Fast and the Furious cover um, where everything's just glowing purple or glowing green or whatever color it decides to do. Um, that helped us out a ton, I think. I think doing that helped us out a ton because people did stop and say, okay, what's this about? Now, how involved are you in the cover design process? I'm assuming you do have a cover designer, right? Yeah, so we have several artists and, um, and then we have, um, a cover designer that then you know just does like the typography and layout and sometimes we'll uh, alter it from there but um my experience with artists i i am not as good of an artist as i would like to be but i do like art quite a bit um and my experience is to give your artists room um which is to say if, you, if you've got an idea share the idea try to make uh make them understand sort of the spirit and the feel that you want and then if they're talented artists they will be able to come up with something that exceeds your expectations um so we have a lot of feedback at first just in trying to say hey this is the vibe we're going for this is the feel we're going for this is existing photographs or existing artwork that we feel if we could evoke this kind of a feeling that will win and then uh, most of our artists are just hey say no more and they go and get us some really good concepts and just uh, build it out from there but um art is something you can you can overproduce um maybe like music right where you just fine-tune everything and like oh make the pinky this much further make this happen here make the arm go here and i think you end up uh kind of ruining things if you get that hands-on so just like just like with writing right like um if someone were to ask you to write a scene and they give you a general idea, your imagination can probably get going and you can think of a lot of unique and, and quirky ways uh, to tell the story. If someone says, okay, but this line of dialogue has to be in paragraph five and in paragraph six, you have to introduce this character and this is the introduction. You know, once you start doing that, everything gets sort of crammed in. So um, a lot of people I think do that with artists um, and, uh, kind of suffer the results. Whereas with us, we just really try to be collaborative and we hear from our artists that we're among their best clients to work with for that reason, because they're the artists, you know, we want them to do their art and we want them to produce a cover that they feel proud of. Um, not a cover that just checks all the check boxes. That's excellent. And it's definitely good advice because I mean, you're an, you're an author, they're an artist, like they know what they're doing. Give, give, yeah. But so you do a couple of things that sort of run counter to uh, advice we've given uh, advice we've received on this, sh this show, which is you've got some pretty varied uh, imagery on your covers across the series. It's not a really strong uh, image brand to your right. covers. So like what's your approach to branding the series in that way? Yeah, the brand is the name for us. So um, for us, the brand is when you see that big Galaxy's Edge logo, that's that's the brand and um and that's just kind of that's a little branding 101 um 
I want, uh, I want people to get excited about any particular book, but we will specifically try to make a series have a different flavor by bringing on different artists. And the, t the, the factor that ties them all together is that typography of the Galaxy's Edge brand so that when you see that, you know, okay, this is what I'm getting into. Um, and that was a conscious effort Nick and I had from the beginning. We didn't want to become the brand. Like we didn't want to become superstar authors with dreams of being like JK Rowling or Stephen King. Of course you take it if you can get it or being Lindsay Broker. Um, you take it if you can get it, but um, we wanted Galaxy's Edge to be the brand so that when people saw that, that's what they were excited about. Um, and if you look at uh, just other big brands, you look at Star Wars, for example, if you actually go through and look at all the different covers for Star Wars, they've had uh, a wide variety of cover styles. You look at some of the stuff that Timothy Zahn is putting out now, it's very different from that period in the late 90s when everything looked like one of the special edition posters where everything was painted and you had all the faces and the composite covers. But the one unifying thing is it always said Star Wars and it always had that exact same font and you knew, okay, this is a Star Wars novel. Um, that's all we wanted to do was just have something so that no matter who the artist was, if, if this artist was available or not available, um, we could get high quality art, but people are going to see the branding through the lettering and know this is, this is this brand and, and support it. Now um, you mentioned star Wars a lot as an influence mm -hmm. and, and just in, you know, in talking about the covers and there you can certainly see star wars influence in some of your covers and one in particular that i noticed mm -hmm. uh, and there's also yeah that also, one <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that was I'm, I'm gonna throw nick under the bus i was like oh i don't i don't like this but but he really wanted to do it so uh and there's also some other like as i look over the covers there's some like as the art style varies mm -hmm. uh it evokes some other things like i i swear i see some like metal gear solid style uh mm -hmm. artwork and stuff like how much uh, are you purposely evoking other other stuff like that? I mean, obviously in the merch, I'm seeing a lot of like GI Joe influence and stuff. So like, sure. how much are you yeah. how much are you uh, intentionally evoking the things that inspired you in your own uh, graphics? Yeah, I think that there is an intentional invoking uh, from time to time with the stuff that looks like Metal Gear. If it's the one I'm talking about, um, that artist. I mean, he worked on Metal Gear, so it's just, so in his mind, it's that like, hey, this is my style, you know, like, like I'm going to paint in my style and that's, that's what they bought and that's what you're buying. Um, so, uh, which is actually a, a good place to go. Um, most video game artists, this is a bit of an aside, most video game artists, um, they're all work for hire, right? So in, in that industry, you'll get a contract for a month and they'll do art for uh, a video game for a month or two months. And, and then they, then that's it. The work is gone. So they're always looking for work and that's a great place to go. If you're trying to find artists, um, obviously the bigger they are, the more they charge because they, they know what they're worth now, right? Like that's, that's just it. Like there's a point where you're like, Hey, I'll, I'll draw for 50 bucks, whatever you want. And, and that's the right call sometimes. And then there's a point where, they say, well, you know, Blizzard gave me $10,000 for my last drawing, so I'll cut you a deal um, and I'll charge you $4,000 for a cover. And that's a true story. And, uh, and you know, we kind of like spit out our, our drinks a little bit when we heard that. But, um, but that's, that's the reality of it. So um, as far as trying to evoke things, we definitely will, will use, uh, uh, use touch tones to say, this is the feel we want to go for. And then we see what the artist uh, does. Um, and I think, uh, I think that you want to kind of surf that line where it's, where it's an homage or a nod, but not an outright um, just redoing of the cover, which is why I'd love to change that cover that you're talking about. And, and it's on our list of things to do, but I just haven't, uh, haven't gone and done it, but yeah. Um, that, that's, that's my journey over here. No, it's okay. You're just reminding me of, of a thing on my to-do list that I need to push up towards the top is, is call an artist and say, Hey, let's, let's do something else here. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think giving a nod to it versus making it, um, making it an outright, just hijacking, you know, just a carjacking is, 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 is ideal mainly because the cover's purpose beyond looking cool is to, signify to potential readers or listeners, this is the kind of thing you're going to get into here. So if someone absolutely loved the movie Aliens and you've got a book of space Marines that are essentially, you know, Hicks and everybody else from Aliens, um, yeah, I mean, 
like helmets aren't copyrighted, right? Like just, just give them that green helmet, make them look like uh, Vietnam from the future and, and just run with it. And people are going to, they're going to go ahead and say, okay, I think I see what I've got here. Um, same thing with a fantasy novel or anything else. Like if you're going to have that, that really awesome dragon in quest, then put that awesome dragon in quest. And if people say this is just like Dragonlance, oh, well, that's kind of what I want you to think because I want you to buy it. So if you like Dragonlance, buy it. Um, so that's, that's the route I go um, with that kind of stuff is just, can I communicate through something that's familiar what they're going to get and then get the right reader as a result of that? That's called um, good marketing and knowing your audience. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. That's, I mean, I didn't want to come out and say it, but. <laughs> okay. We've got a, another question from Facebook. Um, Patty Finn mm -hmm. asks, um, and you've guys, you've already talked about how uh, if you were to redo everything that you would, you'd have more books ready or whatever. Um, but is there anything else that you would have uh, that you would change or you would do differently if you were to relaunch book one? Oh or yeah. Just basically be starting over. Yeah. I mean, we would have made it longer and, uh, and been able to maximize audio without having to bundle because I, I, that, that did still lose us sales. And then I think we would have probably, we experimented with the way we released our books. So book one hits, book two takes place like seven to 10 years afterwards. Book three takes place immediately after book one hits. It was, it was kind of uh, conceptual and some people got it and they loved it because it allowed us to reveal these secrets that seemed absolutely earth shattering as a reader if you follow through. But there were a lot of people that because it was not just a linear telling of a story, just shook their heads and said, oh, I, I, I just don't know what's going on. I just wanted to know what happened next. I wanted part two. Um, and, uh, and that cost us some, some sales. So we probably would rethink how we were going to tell that story probably would have gone linear, but that's a purely commercial decision. Um, artistically, I think the way we told the story right now is the best possible telling financially, we could have made a lot more money if we wouldn't have jumped people around like that. So you guys are still relatively new, but you're coming up on three years, or at least for this series. Yeah. I would say this world, you've kind of expanded it. Right. Um, what are you doing to keep that book one selling it and keep kind of funneling people into the series? Um, you know, we do some advertising, uh, but not a lot. Um, we have like, like I, you maybe have seen it. We have like one Facebook ad where a Marine office, Marine Corps officer uh, gave us a review and just talked about how as a Marine Corps officer, they absolutely loved it and they want to do this and that. And uh, we put that up there and it just got so much feedback and so many comments. And I still get a hundred plus notifications on Instagram every day for that ad um, with people just jumping in and making crayon jokes or making the Marines can read, you know, that kind of joke. It, it just hit right. So we're kind of like, well, it's not broke. And if you're tired of it, sorry, but um, so we keep that running. We do some basic um, KDP ads. We had done BookBub for a while. Didn't feel like the ROI was quite there. Um, but that's that's been about it. Like um, I have friends uh, that rank really well and are spending three hundred dollars a day on ads, and that's just not something that we can we can put ourselves into. We just can't stomach it. We're we're all, we're cheap at the end of the day when it when it really comes down to it. And you kind of have to be. That's the other thing to the question about partnership. Um, if everything's split 50-50, uh, all of a sudden, like, yeah, like you can do well, but you've got to do really well in order for two people to be six-figure authors. Um, and that impacts uh, what you do with the revenue that you get because you've got two families that you're supporting. And, um, and so that changes things too. But for us, we just try to advertise that first book and just continually build word of mouth in the freeways, which is just through community. So um, the people who are out there making their own Galaxy's Edge memes, um, who are talking to their friends, sending the audio book, uh, those people advertise so much more effectively than we can. And so our job is ultimately to make their life enjoyable and to show them that they're appreciated and do whatever we can for them because they're the ones that are really, really keeping this book out there. Well, word of mouth is still <laughs> the best advertising that we all hope to get. You know, nobody right. wants to spend half their money on Amazon ads. So you've got a no. good thing going. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's Amazon's way of reducing the royalty rate. It's their secret backdoor go. trick. They're not going to take it back down. They're just going to make you pay for ads to get the same amount of money. Uh, so it looks like you've taken on some new co-authors too. Uh, what mm -hmm. made you decide to do that? And is there a point when people should consider that or just... 
We, Any regrets? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, no regrets with the guys because they're, they're, they're good. They're good authors. It was good experience. But we did that because that's just what we heard you were supposed to do, right? Like we were, we were kind of like, everything was hot. We had three books out. We were, we were like, well, what do we do now? And everybody was sort of like, oh, you should get some co-authors to write in your world. That's the thing. So we were like, oh, okay. Um, so we, we signed up some people to co-write with us. And uh, that was like back in 2017. And you can see some of those books came out in 2019. So we did that. And then we um, started talking with Audible about doing some exclusives. And so everything was sort of delayed from there. Um, they finished their books. And then we kind of said, hey, we're not going to publish these. But once this deal with Audible is done, you'll thank us. And, um, and that, that worked out okay. Um, from a practical perspective, I think that it's, it's, it's fun to work with other authors. It's always interesting to see other people's takes. But it's very hard to find someone that is as invested in your world as you can be. Um, because like, you know, to me, I'm like a walking galaxy's edge dictionary at this point. Like I think about it so much to keep things together. Um, and you can't possibly expect other people to do that as well. Um, we have a few writers that started off as, as big fans of the series. And so it's easier for them, but, um, people are not going to care about your property as much as you care about your property. And even some of the best authors that we've worked with, um, they just can't know everything, right? Like they can't memorize 20 books. Um, and so by the time you go through and edit everything, what we realized fairly quickly was um, we could have done it ourselves in less time. And so that, that aspect of bringing in a co-writer was not beneficial in a production sense. Like it took longer to process a co-written book than it would have just to write a book ourselves. Um, so that's the, the dollar sign. Um, when it comes to creativity and collaboration, there's value in that. And I had a lot of fun with each one of the co-writers. Um, now we got uh, Karen Travis, um, who wrote Star Wars and is a New York Times bestseller, to write in the series. And that was a totally different experience because she, was, she basically said, I'm Karen Travis. So if I'm going to write in your universe, I get my own little corner and you're going to let me go at it. And we said, yes, yes, absolutely. Whatever you want, Miss Travis, you get. And, uh, and that worked out really well. But uh, by and large, um, I would say don't underestimate the amount of time it takes to get somebody else's work uh, sort of where you want it to be in your world because they can't know it as much and they probably won't love it as much, even if they love it. It's just, it's just the way it goes. Uh, sort of on that topic, on the topic of being a walking dictionary of this sort of thing, when you're working with uh, a, a long running series or a large series and multiple collaborators, I imagine it's got to be important to have a reliable reference or like series Bible to maintain continuity. Mm -hmm. How do you handle that? So um, that's something else we probably should have done from the start, right? Like I, this was the series Bible for the longest time. Um, and that worked out pretty well. Now we have uh, one of our editors uh, maintains a series Bible. We have a friend, uh, John Frader, who uh, is a librarian in real life uh, in New York City. And so he was able to catalog most of our existing books and put everything together. Um, so we have that going forward and that's primarily there so we don't contradict ourselves because it has gotten not only big in the number of books, but big in scope. You know, we have books that are coming out that take place you know, 1500 years before uh, the events in our main series. And, uh, you know, there's a butterfly effect. So um, do that early. And I mean, that's basic writing advice, right? Like even just things like getting eye colors down because you write it and you're like, of course, I'll remember that. And then they go from green eyed to brown eyed or they go from, that's why I don't describe people at all. I just <laughs> <laughs> having had to uh, go back and I, I, we've mentioned earlier in the thing that I'm continuing three long running series this year. And I have learned the hard way that I should have been doing that from the beginning because I've had to yeah. reread several books to get details. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, and I still will listen to the audiobooks again um, before I'm going to write into something, not only to get the details right, but also sometimes you'll hear a little line that will, trigger your imagination you say oh hey it's a whole book right there i'll just i'll just explain that what that meant and and you run from that so um i asked my husband since he's gonna be he started writing and awesome uh, if he had any questions for you uh, his question was and <laughs> do you go to the state fair every year <laughs> oh yeah the washington state fair yeah i live like we live like eight minutes from the fairgrounds yeah. so yeah we go so um Lindsay, you know, because you're from 
you're from this neck of the woods. At least you're familiar with it, right? Um, Everybody's heard of the Puyallup Fair. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. Now, like Puyallup, Puyallup Fair wasn't good enough, so now they call it the Washington State Fair. That's because nobody could pronounce Puyallup. <laughs> I don't know. It's like you grow up, it's on the commercials, but you're right. No one can pronounce Puyallup. Um, so we go every year. My wife's like great great grandfather was one of the founders. So we get this big pack of free tickets every year, um, and uh, and so we go. Yeah, at least we go to the spring fair, we go to the fall fair, uh, took third prize in the black in walnuts this year, um, made sure to enter uh, an old walnut tree into it. So we were, we were pretty proud of that. Um, didn't put the ribbon on the tree though. It's, it's sitting somewhere else, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you can tell them we go and I attribute all my success to state fairs. So, just, <laughs> so yeah, uh, he's from up there. He's like every year we went to the state fair for school. So mm -hmm. yeah, right. Yeah. School day. That's when we avoid it. <laughs> yes. when all the kids are there okay so my serious question because that was not a serious question <laughs> oh, but, is hey, um, how do you maintain excitement for longer series um what do you do to recharge and refresh your batteries and that was why my husband was like he goes mm -hmm. to the fair right <laughs> yeah right um i have a bit of an obsessive personality so it's not really hard for me to maintain excitement um because there's there's just so much waiting to happen and i'm eager to see it happen um that said there are times where I'll feel like I am just not being creative enough or the ideas I'm coming up with are just maybe rehashes. Like we have a saying, even in military science fiction, um, one of the things we wanted to avoid was like, how many times can you have your, your commando team face overwhelming odds and it looks like they're all going to die and nope, they made it. You know, you can only follow that formula so many times before it starts to feel like, oh, okay, which is why we tried to expand the universe as big as we did. Um, so that we could have the freedom to explore and not get stuck there. Um, when that happens, I'll typically just pick up a side project that I want to do. And uh, co-writes are an easy thing to do that with. You just sort of get together and say, hey, wouldn't this be a fun idea? And, um, and then sort of get it out of your system. But I, I try to reserve that only for when I'm feeling like, oh, man, this is just not, this is not what, uh, what the audience deserves. This is going to be a little bit too too convenient, a little bit too simplistic. The big twist that everyone's sort of expecting isn't going to be there or isn't going to be big enough. And, uh, and that's worked out for me. Uh, that's the way I've done it. But the trick okay. is just to keep writing something. All right, very cool. You know, I've had conversations with romance authors who say they get tired of writing sex scenes because it's always the same to mm -hmm. some extent. And I kind of feel that way writing combat stuff at this point. Oh, yeah. 50 books. I'm like, okay, how can we do this differently? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's that's exactly it, right? You're, you're totally right. It's like how many, you know, being a student of history, I think, helps out a bit. You can say, okay, what kind of wrinkle can be thrown into it? But eventually you're sort of like, I don't know what else to do. I mean, there's, there's only so many ways movement and combat can work before you feel like you're revisiting things. All right. Well, we wanted to also ask you a few questions about merchandising. So we're mm -hmm. going to kind of wrap up with that stuff. Good. I do want to say you're the first person I've met who's won a prize for walnuts. Oh, pretty good, huh? I've, I've met a pumpkin person and horse people, so I don't know. Yeah, I don't have I don't have any left, but the next time we're in the same room, I'll bring some to you. We've got we've Excellent. got some. We usually freeze <laughs> them because it's a pretty big yield. Very good. All right. Well, could you tell us what made you decide to get into the merchandising and what all you're doing now? Yeah, uh, that was uh, a similar a similar thing. Um, properties that people love, they love to kind of show their enthusiasm for. Um, like it's not uncommon to see Doctor Who or Harry Potter, uh, Star Wars, Star Trek on bumper stickers. And so we just wanted to initially provide an opportunity for people to sort of express their, their fandom um, without being heavy handed over it. So we started off the way I think a lot of authors start off just to say, hey, if, if you really like this, here's how you can get signed books. Um, and then people went from signed books to, you know, well, some posters would be nice, which are a pain. I don't, we don't do any of that anymore. It's just too much, too much work. But, um, but uh, then people started saying, because it's a military series, they said, well, can we get like, uh, can we get patches? So that was one of the first things we did. We started doing just little Velcro patches like this, like that. And um, they just sold so crazy. And then once that audience realized they could ask for things and that we would go ahead and get them done, you know, polo shirts, hats, um, bumper stickers. Um, it just kind of went from there. So um, now we've got like this little, like these are our bumper stickers and we ordered 300 of those. We've sold 220 already. Um, it just, 
just sort of keeps happening. But I, I think it's, it, it's a matter of when you know that you've got a fan base that's enthusiastic, it's just finding fun and authentic ways to let them show their fandom, but also let them show it in a way that is not a total corporate branding attempt. And uh, that's what a lot of people miss, right? So like, you know, we don't put our name on most of our stuff. We don't even put Galaxy's Edge on most of our stuff. And the stuff that does say Galaxy's Edge tends to sell the smallest amount. And, and that's because there's an aspect of being a, being a fan or being a geek where you kind of want to put it out there, but you don't necessarily want to put it out there so much that people are going to, to judge you by it. Now, if you wear a Star Wars shirt, it's like everyone knows that. But like when I was a kid, um, Growing up, we, we would like uh, wrestling and um, like you would wear a wrestling shirt unless it said like, this is a wrestling shirt. Like you had to wear it in a way that was sort of like uh, secret because you just didn't want to expose yourself too much. So that's kind of the, the view we had with our merchandising was, hey, let's just take art from the book. Let's take stuff that looks cool in its own right but doesn't hit you over the head as this is mobile advertising. This is a Nike swoosh because we're not Nike um, and just see what happens. And as a result, that store developed and grew. And um, like I said, when we were in Vegas together, you know, we reached a point at, uh, where we make more from advertising or from marketing um, than we do from eBooks. And um, I don't think that would have happened if we hadn't have pushed on audio so hard, but, but it did happen. Um, now more people are buying, spending money on shirts and stickers and patches and books um, than they are on the actual eBooks themselves. That's awesome. And I feel like that's like the awesome tip for the episode. I'm going to keep using the word awesome because why okay. wouldn't you? Everything's um, awesome. Not to put your, not to make it like you're branding your entity, that um, because now that I think about it, you're right. You know, you see like the Serenity spaceship on the mm -hmm. people's car, or the uh, Star Trek triangle, whatever right. logo yeah. thing. Not necessarily right. the, the name Imperial of logo. it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You see like the Imperial logo or the Rebel logo. You don't see Star Wars, right? Like there's just something about it that when you say, you know, it, then it starts to feel corporate and it feels forced um, versus just here you go. It's sort of like they're in a secret club because only other people who are brown coats are going to know exactly. what spaceship means. Exactly that. So who is fulfilling this stuff for you? Because that's got to be some hours each month too. Well, I have seven slave laborers. And, um, and so, so they, they, they get to work on that. Um, so my oldest is uh, 15. Uh, he'll be 16 in October. And so that's his, uh, his part-time job is getting into the basement and loading up the day's mail and uh and hopefully someone orders priority mail so that the post office comes to your house and if not you know it's just uh load up the boxes and head to the post office and and go from there but um it it is some work and there's sources that will outsource it um but like i established earlier we're like super cheap so if we don't have to give up a percentage we won't so see now i know why people have kids it's uh, one of the many reasons, my friend. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, w I was going to ask what sort of things make worthwhile merch, but we've discussed that. Uh, is there sort of like a, an ideal price range you find that people like? Because I know like some people are like, oh, I want premium stuff out there. Mm -hmm. But I know yeah. when I was trying to make T-shirts and stuff that my goal was try to get it to a level that I would consider buying that shirt if mm -hmm. I was interested in it. So like what sort of things do you target in that regard? Yeah, I mean, that, so that's pricing theory. Um, and... Uh, and I think that the, the answer is uh, you just don't be afraid to experiment with the price. Um, when we did our first subscription model, like I said, we had 99 cents, $5, $10. And at this point, every subscription is just a flat $10. Um, we don't ask for more. It's just, if you want to subscribe, it's $10. They get access to all our books early. Um, they get a lot of other bonuses as well. Um, for shirts, uh, it's just kind of just playing around a little bit. We find that some people do want to buy a really premium shirt. And other people are much happier to get like a, a $15 shirt that's just cheap and they don't care. Um, so variety and then just seeing what works and, and they'll tell you what works, right? Like you'll have stock that you have to put on clearance and then you'll go, okay, never again. Um, you'll have things that once you actually ship it, it eats so much of the profit margin that it's, you're just, it's not worth it. Um, but then also have some loss leaders like, uh, have a few things that you're either breaking even on or even maybe losing a little bit of money because you want to sell. 
Um, because when you have your own storefront and you have people going through, um, every purchase is usually also in addition to your mailing list. Um, so, you know, we, we have it very clear where they can opt in as opposed to you're going to be opted in unless you opt out. But, um, but we've grown our mailing list tremendously just by giving away free things like wallpapers of uh, cover art um, or giving away bumper stickers like I showed um, for, you know, pretty close to what it costs us to do uh, when you factor in shipping and, sh and handling. Um, but those aren't necessarily for us to make money. Those are for us to endear our fan base and grow them. I imagine that the patches and stickers and stuff you can just mail for a stamp. So that's probably. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. The stickers you can do for a stamp, the patches, um, we, we go first class because you get tracking at least. Um, so it's a little bit more expensive, but, uh, if, if a patch gets lost in the mail, uh, it adds up after a while because of the cost per patch. And have you found like with the $10 a month, do you feel stressed <laughs> at all? Like I got to give them something every month. Do they expect that or no? There is an aspect of that. We've been pretty good at giving them uh, at least a book a month. Um, what we do is um, we just sort of run everything through that. So um, with our Audible deal, uh, it's exclusive, but the people that get the advanced stuff, they're excluded from that. So the people that don't wanna wait six months for an ebook oftentimes just become subscribers and get it before it's even available to audio. Um, and then anything else we're doing, anything else we're tangentially involved in always goes through that group. So our, our goal is always to say, um, you should feel like you're ripping us off. And if, if you don't, then there's a problem in what we're providing. But if someone were to go right now and sign up and become an insider, the first thing they would get is an email linking them to about nine books that haven't been released yet that they can listen to. And uh, we don't penalize people for showing up and then dropping out. Um, you know, people can absolutely take advantage and say, okay, I'm gonna spend 10 bucks and get your next nine books. See ya and bye. But uh, we have a very low churn because again, we're, we're just trying to build a community. We're just trying to build a group of people that kind of want to be loyal to Galaxy's Edge and it's working out really well. So it helps to have stuff actually done ahead of time as opposed to me where I'm like, okay, I finished the book, I'm going to publish it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, our hand was forced in that um, because now that, you know, at, at, at a very minimum, it's not going to come out until the audio is ready. Um, you know, when you're getting, uh, you know, uh, our, our next series, which should come out this month, uh, Stephen Lang, who is in Avatar and Gods in General, is, is reading that. So that's really cool. But also actors don't just start next week, right? They're like, okay, great. We've got a deal, which took six months to make. I'll be able to read the first book in four months. So you end up sitting with all these finished titles for a long time, uh, just working the system. And, uh, and so we've tried to make our system work for that. And I know... I feel like most authors who try merchandising end up losing money or not making money. Mm -hmm. Is there kind of a point where like you need to have be this big and have this many fans who are going to 10% mm -hmm. will buy the stuff, you know, that you should consider before jumping into it? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, I think that the mistake authors can make with that is to try to have a fully stocked store and just anticipate everything anyone wants. Like here's, you know, here's coffee cups, here's, you know, like the space balls, right? Like, you know, here's t-shirts, breakfast cereal, everything. Um, but, but you don't have to do that. You just have to have a few things to start off with and then just expand based on feedback. Like if you see those things are selling reliably and um, you can reorder them and get some more, um, then just branch off. Like what else is going to be successful? If they like stickers, will they like patches? If they like patches, will they like t-shirts? If they like t-shirts, will they like hats? And each time you find an answer, you just keep going further down that decision tree and your inventory will stock up. But, but none of your fans, none of your readers are going to go to your website and be like, what? Only two stickers. I'm out. I'm never coming back. They're either going to get it or they're going to say, I don't love it that much. And at least you don't have $2,000 worth of inventory just sitting in your basement then. All right. Well, I think that is about it from us. Do you have any final advice for our listeners who are hoping to become the next Galaxy's Edge? Um, I, yeah, just go for it. Um, like, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, here's our honest strategy. Um, we both uh, come up with our idea. We both pray together and um, go with the expectation that it's going to be blessed or it's not going to be blessed. And we're going to be friends and we're going to be thankful regardless of what happens. And uh, that was our view starting Galaxy's Edge. It's our view going into our, our, next, uh, our next venture. It's our view going into every book. Um, 
at the end of the day, I think a lot of us, it's great to make money doing this, but a lot of us are doing this because we love to do it. And I'm, I'm blessed to be able to do it and have it be my full-time job. But, um, uh, you know, people could stop buying these books and I couldn't stop writing them because like, I need to know what's going to happen. So love, love your work, love your characters at that level. And, um, and it will help you weather like, uh, those first three books I had where it's just not exactly what you thought it would be. Well, sometimes you have to write those early books too. And just, then you can learn maybe there's a different market or something else I love that might be a little more potential there. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the worst thing that could happen is to get a lot of eyes on something that wasn't as good as you could have done. And you don't realize that until you develop yourself as a writer. All right. Well, where can people find you online and what's the book one or wherever they should jump into the series if they're interested? So if you want to see what we're doing for marketing, you can go to galaxiesedge.us and uh, that's our official Galaxy's Edge website. That'll give you an idea of some of the products we have and what we're selling. Um, we both have our own author websites that we don't really update very often. Um, if you want to get into the series, audiobooks, go to uh, search for Galaxy's Edge Part 1. Uh, you'll find it there. And if you want to read, you just search my name and probably Legionnaire is the first book that'll pop up. Uh, but just go ahead and don't click the one that's the ad, the one that says sponsored. Don't click that. That one cost me money. Click the one right below that and, uh, and then we're all happy. Yes, I love when authors are doing market research and like clicking all your ads. It's like, stop yeah, doing that. Yeah, I know, I know. Like little hate clicks on you, yep. There you go. I'd like to think Amazon only charges you once per IP, but I, I don't know that for sure. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't put it past them, right? All right, we will put your websites and books in the show notes. Uh, folks can find us at sixfigureauthors.com with the number six. Thank you everyone for listening and thank you to Joshua Pearson for producing the show and thank you, Jason, for joining us. Thank you, everybody. It was really cool. And you're going to say hi to your husband. Tell him he's cool. Okay, will do. <laughs> See you all later. So long, everybody.